really, you know, you probably all have heard why you can have pros uh, issues after um, surgery, but unfortunately it's one of those surgeries that does cause problems. You know why? If you think we've got the bladder, and then for men they've got that prostate gland that the the neck of the bladder sort of nestles into. So if you imagine my arms are the bladder, my hands are that closure at the base where the sphincter is with the urethra running through, and you've got that lovely firm prostate that it nestles into. For some men their prostate might have been a bit too big and a bit too firm and actually been too much of a constriction. But some bulk's a good thing. So of course take that prostate out and you're left with a cavity. Well, instead of being supported, closed, now the bladder neck doesn't have as much support as it used to have. Plus, after the surgery, you've got inflammation. You've got the normal tissue response that people get after any sort of injury or, or surgery. So that red hot swollen, well, of course, that goes and turns your nerves off in the area. So instead of having the nerve reflexes telling the the sphinct muscle, that sir clip around the top of the urethra, you might not be getting that for some time. And even when those reflex messages start passing again, they might not be as reliable as they used to. Think back to just after you had your surgery, you might have been aware that in the, so those earlier weeks, you were much better overnight. You might have actually felt an urge to go to the loo, but by day it wasn't as strong, it wasn't as good, it wasn't as reliable. Well, that's what I'm talking about, those reflex messages. Um, another issue with those nerves not passing messages is in those early weeks after surgery, you might do too much. And if you can't feel that you've had damage to an area, you can't feel that you're straining it too much. If you've had inguinal hernia surgery or a sprained ankle, <coughs> you'd be very aware of any pressure or pain or using the area would hurt. But if you've been to the dentist and had a local anaesthetic, and the dentist says don't eat for two hours, not because of the filling, but because you can't tell what is your cheek and what is your ham sandwich. Hence, don't eat a sandwich until you've got the sensation in your cheek again. Well, in that prostate area, if you don't have your nerve functions, your, your messages, you can't tell what's too much activity. So in those early weeks where we say rest, rest and re more rest, you might not be resting enough in that early time. So too much too soon can be a problem. But at some point we do need to get you back to real life. So how, what's the next step? Well, learning how to use your pelvic floor exercises before your surgery has certainly been shown to be a helpful thing. Not that helpful if you've already had your surgery and you didn't get a chance to, but before your surgery when you can feel what's going on and you've got the clarity of sensation, it's much easier to learn what you've got down there and how it works. And you've got time to practice it, you've got time to put it into action, experiment with it, so that after the surgery when you really need it, you know what you're doing. It can be a bit harder to teach people in the, that early weeks, but certainly, you know, down the track a bit, it's never too late. <coughs> Stopping the flow of urine isn't a good way to exercise your pelvic floor. It's a good quick check. It's a good, if you can stop the flow of urine midstream, then you know you've got the right muscle. But it's not a way of practicing it. It's not the every time you go to the loo you stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. Your reflexes don't like that much. But as a, a, a once every so often, can I do that? It's an okay check, but not to exercise. Um, the other thing to say about the pelvic floor exercise, pelvic floor muscle is, you've got to get the right action. And it's about closing the bladder neck that we need. So if I come over to, to the whiteboard, Oops. Sorry. Oops. I've got to get my little diagram because I'm not a natural artist. So if you've got your bladder and you've got the urethra that joins on, and men have quite a long urethra, you used to have the prostate gland around here 
And the muscles we're interested in are a sling of muscle that acts front to back. It spans the pelvic cavity. So what you're sitting on is that pelvic outlet between the tailbone at the back, the pubic bone at the front, that area between your legs. Well, the pelvic floor spans that area. So it does span sideways, but the muscle fibres predominantly run as a front to back direction. So the action is front to back in action. Of course, you used to have that prostate as that bulk round here. This bit is the bit that we want to close off. That bit's where the sphincter is that you need to be able to shut. The bladder neck's the bit we've got to close. So if you've got a muscle down here and we want to close up there, then squeezing down here isn't the right action. We've got to get action up here. So if you've got a sling, if you've got a hammock between trees and it's going to shorten, what direction is it going to move? Up. Yep, it's not rocket science. So at most, your pelvic floor is going to flatten out, which means probably about a half centimetre lift. It's really quite insignificant if you think about it, but it's not. That half centimetre lift is lifting the bulk between, which of course used to be your prostate, up and the urethra is also lifted up. So the angle change upwards makes this angle more acute. So it's like when you're hosing the garden, you don't want to hose anymore. It's not about squeezing the hose, it's about bending it over. And the bending it over is what we're looking for. So you've got to get the right action for your pelvic floor. It's not squeezing, it's lifting. And it's not the whole area you need. It's the bit round the bladder neck. It's the front part you need. So it's learning the correct technique that's important. So I might say a few things that are just a little bit different than some of the general brochures that are out there. So I'm going to talk about lift, not squeeze. I'm going to talk about front, not back. So we'll get back to that because I'd like you to be able to fill in your homework. So I've already said after the surgery, you've got to rest. You've got to let the area recover. Our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made. They can recover from injury and surgery, but that takes some time and you've got to work with it. So if you are straining a lot in that recovery time, then instead of that cavity where the prostate was bulking up, with scar tissue, filling up that cavity and providing some scar tissue bulk around the bladder neck, that area is going to be strained and open. Well, of course, the sphincter might be trying to close it, but it won't be able to do it as easily as if there's bulk there as well. So it's the bulk we're trying to for let form. A bit like if you've concreted a path, you've got to let that path cure. You've got to let it firm up so it's got some integrity before people start walking on it. So if you're straining everything too soon, that's not going to be helpful. So one of the main suggestions I give people before the surgery is to, to give yourself a chance. Wait. Don't do too much too soon. Anything that involves a strain is a problem. But of course, if you don't have your nerves to give you sensation, how do you know what's too much strain? Well, of course, once the catheter is out, after the surgery, you've got urine leakage as your guide. So it's got to be your guide in those early weeks. But ongoing, you've got to get to a point where you want to get back to normal life. So at what point do you, do you stop too much resting and start getting back to normal life to try and prompt your body to firm up that scar tissue and give yourself some bulk? Yeah, there's a bit of a change over time and that's where guidance can help. Being realistic is really important and I find some men, I think all men, I think all people, want to recover now, you know, then, you know, three weeks ago, three months ago, three years ago. You know, you want it to be right, you want to be back the way you were and as frustrating as it is, you know, most men do have continence problems after prostate surgery 
most men do need some help to get their continents working again and some men aren't going to get to full full recovery full healing you know some men are going to have an ongoing problem because for whatever reason their body doesn't bulk up that cavity as effectively because the nerves that were passing messages to the bladder neck just don't quite make their full connection or full functioning again it could be that radiation gets in the way of what was going to be good healing and that sort of makes everything a bit rigid a bit um, immobile it means you can't close off things as well so that can be an issue so all in all pelvic floor muscle is your tool it's the one voluntary support you've got whether it's in that early post-op time once the catheter's out or down the track um, you may not be able to determine how well your reflexes have repaired how easily the sphincter closes to really close off that bladder neck how much the cavity where your prostate was is rebolt but you can use your pelvic floor to get whatever lift you can to get that bladder neck bending over to, to nod the bladder to close off the bladder neck like that bending the hose when you don't want to hose the garden anymore the pelvic floor muscle is voluntary you can make it happen the difficulty is remembering to do it before you do anything that might make you leak so if we're talking about muscle control skill comes really quickly skill comes in somewhere an hour to an hour and a half of practice so getting the knack of something. If, if your grandchildren wanted to teach you how to skateboard, it wouldn't take much to get, get you the knack of balancing on a skateboard. But it would have to be on a pretty flat street and lots of grass either side of the footpath. You know, you'd fall off a few times. It would take practice, it would take skill to get the balance off. A bit learning a musical instrument, how to form your mouth to blow the trumpet so it actually sounds like something worthwhile. Skill comes quickly, an hour to an hour and a half of practice. So add up all those minutes and you will get better at it with the right guidance and repetitive practice of the right thing. But if you need more strength, more oomph, more endurance, more resting tone than you've got, that's gonna come in eight to 12 weeks of slogging it out. So just because you can do it better doesn't mean that the muscle has the, the daily endurance to cope with the activities that you're adding up over the day or the strength for some of the activities. You might be able to find where your pelvic floor is very easily and be able to switch it on while you're sitting there, but can, do you have enough strength in the muscle to be able to unload that 50 litre bag of potty mix out of the boot of the car and get it to the wheelbarrow without leaking. Can you, have you got the endurance to cope with that two hour long probus walk that you would like to go on? You know, half hour shopping trip's okay, but a two hour walk, uh, that, that, you know, you're leaking by the end of it. So that comes with slogging it out, repetitively using that muscle, building it up. But that doesn't mean it switches on. That doesn't mean it switches on because you're doing an activity that might make you leak. That's a behavior. We've got reflexes. We've got, does it kick in in your, without you thinking about it? Well, the pelvic floor is a postural muscle. So if you're upright against gravity, it does, it does work, it does function. But is it functioning enough for what you need it? Well, that's behavior, that's you being intentional about switching it on at the right force at the right time to get the closure of the bladder neck you need. And that's, that's something that won't come in quickly just because you've got the strength and the skill. That's something that is a behavior that you have to adopt. So my analogy for that is like a child with a lisp if they keep speaking with a lisp, that's how they form their 
mouth to make an S sound and they're going to keep doing that unless they learn the technique to say their S's and they practice to get the strength and endurance in their muscles to be able to. But then do they? Well probably only if they think about it. But if they consistently practice it, their behaviour of how they make their mouth say their S's will change it. But that's going to take 6 to 12 months to change that. So, so changing our behaviour, adopting a new way of doing things, takes a lot more than just can you and have you got the oomph for it. Um, having done knee exercises, I do realise how much you've got to slog it out. Hence the green exercise diary. How do, how do you remember to do your exercises? How do you keep at it for that six to eight to 12 months so that your behaviour kicks in? So that you use your pelvic floor as the tool to do the job. Well, before we get on, back onto pelvic floor then, I would have to say that walkers do better. So, um, prostate surgery and a number of other continence issues can certainly limit people's activity. So, you know, if you if you're a competitive rower or a weightlifter, that could that could be a bit of a problem. But walking is a bit of gentle impact. It's repetitive. Uh, it's over a, a, a time, an endurance of that activity. So it's a, a light strain over a longer time. And it seems to, well, it's, a, it's an activity that doesn't seem to strain the area too much, but it does seem to kick the area into working a bit better from a muscle control point of view but also from an endurance point of view and a connective tissue fabric of the body. So where we talk about pelvic floor muscles, we always think of the contracting bit, but there's also the, the fabric that that contracting bit sits in, what, what we health professionals would call fascia. Or you know, if you look at, look at muscle in a butcher shop, you know, that sort of silvery sheets that compartmentalise the muscle the red fleshy part of the muscle. Well that fabric or that fascia needs to also be strong and walking, something about that impact of walking helps that. So if you're not currently a walker, I would certainly add that to your daily routine and the suggestion is for exercise to be doing 30, at least 30 to 40 minutes of moderate to intense exercise most if not every day of the week. So if you're adding up walking, now we're not talking about strolling around the shops. I know that might get your heart rate up if you see that, you know, tool on special at the hardware store. You know, for, for women I will say that handbag in the, in the um, handbag shop. But that's retail therapy. That's not cardiovascular or connective tissue fitness. We're talking about a dedicated walk where you've got a heel strike enough that you're pushing the pace to move your legs to get you that little bit out of breath. So you can still carry on a conversation but you couldn't sing an aria. You'd, you have to take a breath at the end of every line. So walkers do better and certainly from studies looking at um, uh, teenagers, women after childbirth, men after prostate surgery, Older people in um, residential care, like nursing homes with continence problems, if people have not been walking, by adopting walking as an exercise, they improve their continence. So it's definitely something to add to the list of strategies. Can I Certainly. Um, uh, before I had my um, prostate surgery in 2016, I think it was, um, my physiotherapist made me walk every day uh, oh, for months doing pelvic floor contractions. Yeah. Every uh, 20 steps, or 20 steps on and then 20 steps on rest. Yeah. Um, with the walking after surgery, should you 
also do your pelvic floor contraction exercises as you walk. Look, if you've done that before the surgery and you've had the endurance to be able to maintain that, then yes, continue it afterwards. For someone who hasn't done it before and doesn't know if they've got the endurance to cope with the day, then after the surgery you might not have the, the capacity to use the muscle over your daily activities as well as your walk if you're working it that hard. But yes, the, the idea is to push the limits a bit. Okay. And walking is, is one physical activity where you can push the limits that's not too much. Well, it's very interesting uh, that you uh, talk about walking because uh, this morning I walked all around Pennon Hills trying to find a parking spot. And, and um, you know, I really walked this morning. And when I... Uh, before I came this evening, my um, uh, weight of my incontinence pads was much lower than previous days. And I, yeah. gee, that was interesting. Yeah, it's something about toning up the area. It's about using it in a normal everyday activity that tells the area it has to be working more. My analogy would be, imagine a radio and in the background, well our postural muscles are like that radio. If you're up against gravity, they're working. But of course you need that muscle to be working a bit more. You need that radio a bit louder. And walking is one way to keep the volume up, rather than let it slide down to quiet because there's inflammation in the area. It's you know, not not getting the same nerve messages to tell it to be as active. Thank you very much for that. I'll yeah. uh, I'll go back to walking twice a day now. Definitely. The one thing I would say though, you may then need to rest. So walking's good, but then you might need to have a rest. And of course, if you're thinking of a muscle that's a sling down there, sitting down is not resting it. It's a postural muscle, you're upright against gravity, it's still not resting. So if you want to give a postural muscle a rest, you've got to lie down. I'm not talking about lie down for an hour, I'm talking, you know, maybe 10 minutes. So in that early post-op time, I'll tell men that it would be good to lie down 10 minutes of every hour while the catheter's in and maybe that first week or two once it's out. It might be then 10 minutes of every two hours. Within a month, it might be 10 minutes after activity. You might do a bit of gardening, lie down for 10 minutes. It might be you've got gone for your morning walk, you lie down for 10 minutes. You know, when you're getting back to bowls or golf or tennis or whatever it is, you get home, you lie down, maybe half an hour if it's something like tennis. So it does need a rest because it's going to be working more than it would normally work as a postural muscle. But walking is a good activity and it might be that that's helping it to tone up. Yeah, definitely. Kim, what about cycling? Um, as, as long as you've got to at least probably 12 weeks after the surgery, I don't see any reason why uh, it would, cycling would be a problem. It probably doesn't give you the same impact activity that walking does. So I still think walking is really important. But to add some cycling to some walking, fine once you've got beyond that time where the pressure of the seat up between your legs could be a problem. And I've had two men after their biopsies cause significant bleeding and discomfort where they really did understand when the surgeon and I said no bike for 12 weeks. They did understand why we said 12 weeks. So, you know, it's just, it's really the pressure of the bike seat. Um, and so saying, oh, but what about a recumbent bike? You know, those lying down bikes? Mm, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute when we get to the exercise bit. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, but, but something with impact would be good. Um, yeah, and I don't think anything replaces walking. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I've, I've talked a bit about early recovery you know once the catheter's out in those early weeks at some point you've really got to be getting back to real life and and for me that would probably be around about the 12 week mark at some point you've got to say your body's 
through that inflammatory phase and has bulked up to a degree and you're now into the remodeling of the scar tissue that has filled that cavity and the remodeling will happen better if you start adding some impact so you know dedicated hard walk um, some resistance so some lifting some it could be return to gym activities some gardening activities, things that, that mean that your abdominal muscles are adding a pressure and your pelvic floor is supporting against that. And that guiding that carefully, but, but adding that into your day so you actually are, again, pushing your body to remodel that scar tissue area. Um, bladder habits come into that. So, early on I would say pee often. I know there are brochures out there that say try to hold three to four hundred mils, try to hold three to four hours. I agree with that once you've got some reflex activity kicked in but in the early weeks if you're holding on to get an urge that's never going to come and you're just passively leaking into a pad it doesn't make much sense to me. Whereas to, if you can actively pee every hour and keep your pad much drier, that would make a lot more sense. But once your reflexes kick in, once you're getting an urge to go to the toilet, once you can feel that urge and hold on to that urge, that's when you can start working on it to work back towards normal. And for some men it'll be within that first even month of surgery. For some it'll be not till after four to six weeks, but certainly before the 12 weeks. But by about 12 weeks after surgery, we've got to start looking at trying to practice holding on. Because it's all very well to be very good at emptying, very good at passively emptying, like leaking, but even to be very good at actively emptying is not such a good thing to be good at. You want to be good at not emptying. You want to be good at holding on. And when we talk about continence, we really are talking about control. Incontinence is not being in control. So control is about being able to hold on to a decent volume. So what's a decent volume? Well, probably at least 300 to 400 mils. First pee in the morning after a stretch of sleep could be even 600 mil or more. Um, trying, being able to hold on for a decent amount of time, so potentially three to four hours, depends how much you're drinking and how often you're peeing, uh, how the volume you're peeing, but you know, a decent length of time. When you feel the urge to go to the loo, can you tell it to be quiet, go away, I'm not interested? Can you actually defer that urge? And we're probably talking at least 20 minutes. So if you feel that urge and you've got to go in the next five minutes, that doesn't make life very easy. That means you're forever looking for toilets. Whereas if you can feel that urge and say, no, nope, I'm busy, I'm not interested, I will hold on and wait till it's a convenient time for you to then go, that then gives you a degree of control in your life and it means you're practicing not peeing, which is the the part of continence you want to be good at. You want to be good at not leaking, not peeing. So practicing your normal bladder habits is a really important part and I think that's a part we often forget. We, we focus on the using your pelvic floor to hold but then well for how long? For what's a normal volume? You know if, if you don't know what your volumes are the best way is to grab a measuring jug and pop it in your loo, it, you know, bathroom, so that for perhaps a day or two, every time you go to the loo, you pee in the jug instead of the toilet. So you can write down the volume you pass and the time you went. So you've got some idea of time, volume, time, volume, time, volume. So you can see that pattern over the day and the night to see what your normals are. You, if you want to get really technical, you could then add in what, what degree of urge do you feel? Is it, a, is it no urge? Is it a mild urge? Is it a strong urge? Is it a panic? You know, you're elbowing your family out of the way because it's your toilet and they wouldn't want to get in your way. You know, do you put a number to it? Do you just put a word to it? 
And also, is there any leakage? Is it leakage because you've got the urge, or is it just incidental leakage that's happening not when the urge is there? Those leaks can actually be a bit harder to deal with because often it's when everything sort of turns off that you get the leak rather than when, when you're toned up from the walk or you're thinking about the activity. But at some point, we've got to look at what's normal bladder habits. But first, you've got to know what normal is. You know, three to 400, three to 500 mils, four to six times over 24 hours, perhaps one overnight. And you've got to know what your habits are. Well, what volume do you, is, is your rough average? How often are you going? How much are you passing as your biggest volume in the day? What are your triggers to leaking? What are your triggers to not being able to get to the loo when you've got that urge? And having a chart gives a lot of information to then be able to address what your issues are in what's not a normal bladder habit. Questions? Oh, thanks, Kim. My question might be a bit outside the scope of the talk, but in terms of normal, my main problem is during the night, waking up frequently to have a wee. Now, I don't yeah. know whether that's a consequence. It was the same before the operation, but it hasn't got any better after. And I yeah. sort of thought it might, but I'm still with you know, getting up three, four times a night. Yeah, and, and that's what we call nocturia. And there's lots of causes for it. Um, before the surgery, it can be because the prostate's somewhat enlarged and therefore sort of cork in the bottle. But there's a lot of other reasons. Um, one of the other areas I treat is lymphedema. So when you've got someone with very swollen legs, of course, during the day, you know, fluid seeps down and gets stuck in the leg. So someone after orthopedic surgery or after an injury where they've got a lot of swelling in their leg, may find that they're not needing to pee very often by day because all the fluid's stuck in their legs. It can't actually get to your kidneys to be filtered out to get to your bladder. And legs are quite large. They can hold a decent amount of fluid without even looking or appearing swollen. So as we age and our veins get a bit loose and our skin gets a bit loose and everything heads south, leg edema, not lymphedema but just fluid sitting down in the legs because of flax veins and less muscle tone to pump it up and more sedentary activity can mean that you're then paying bigger volumes at night. Again, a chart will help show that and for some people where that's the case, they may pee quite small volumes and not very often by day, much bigger volumes once they're into bed at night and more often to the point where they're doing two thirds to three quarters of their urinary output in the nighttime hours. And so afternoon, evening walk to get a pumping action with rest with the legs elevated, perhaps com gentle compression stockings, exercise in a, in a pool. So, you know, walking in sort of waist to thigh deep water so that the pressure of the water helps to get the fluid to come up in the afternoon or evening are all strategies we use to try and get the fluid up without having to take a diuretic, which doesn't always address the issue that it's stuck down there and it isn't actually getting to your kidneys until you, know, until you actually are lying down. But there's lots of other causes of, of nocturia. One for the GP. It could be, but again, do a chart and see what your volumes are. Yep. See what's, what your pattern is and that it's the sort of thing you that take to your GP so that they've got something to work on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had my operation about seven years ago. I did exercise and everything. I came here to do Qigong and uh, everything went quite well. In the last couple of years or so, uh, the things you described that happening during the night, well, it's, uh, it's happening, but it's also happening to my wife. So I wonder how much is, uh, is it con can it be contributed to the, uh, the prostate uh, uh, operation or simply old age? Yeah, and, and, and is it old age or is it just change of behaviour as we age? You know, I think, yes, our veins lose their elasticity. Our muscles might lose some of their bulk, but then again, if we're 
less active than we used to be, we're not keeping our muscles bulked. We're not keeping the, um, the reflexes within the veins that adapt and push the fluid up. So yes, and, and I think also if it, weight can be an issue with that because if our limbs are bulkier and we're sitting, we've got more, uh, more squash to sort of hold back fluid. So, you know, increased weight gain as we age can also be contributing to that. So same strategies could help both of you. Yeah. Yeah, do a chart and see what your pattern is. See what your volumes are by day, what your volumes are at night. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm now five years post-surgery and I was fortunate enough to have a full recovery. Fantastic. So I gave up the pelvic floor exercises altogether, but I found in the last few months, I've always had a physical job and everything like that. I'm starting to get uh, leakage uh, occurring now just in the last few months. Is that something I should maybe take up the pelvic floor again? I would think so. And is it from a, a keeping tone in the muscle? Is it, is it a tool, the tool that you're not switching on? You know, mm. if you had to hammer a nail in the wall, would you take your shoe off and bang it in? Or would you go out to the garden shed and get the perfect liquid hammer you've got to do the job? You know, the pelvic floor is the tool to close off the bladder neck. So, definitely. So it's something we should continue to keep doing, the pelvic you floor. You may need yeah. to. Okay. You know, it, it, it may be that you had full recovery mm. because you were working the system to, to add up all the good, yeah. holding on strategies. But of course, if you're not actively working on it, does it slide down, does your degree of control slide down enough that you've just dropped below that threshold for good That's activity feels, and you just yeah. need to push it back above that threshold again. So walking for exercise and perhaps, you know, you might not need to be as diligent with remembering your pelvic floor. It might be two sets a day and using it in your everyday. You're switching it on as your tool in your everyday may be enough. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I seem to have uh, a problem with uh, lower end. The at night I can build a volume of about 200 mil when yeah. I'm at be in bed. Some nights I get up and uh, void during the evening. Sometimes I go through. It always seems to be 200 mil, but in those uh, in the smaller amounts uh, okay. when I'm standing, walking, doing. Uh, vertical exercises, there's there, there's not nothing being retained, and uh, uh, it, it's as in you're leaking instead uh, of being able to leak all the time. Okay. Yes. So Very and, and frustrating. unless I'm sitting down or lying down, mm. I'm I'm not uh, retaining any of the no the degree fluid. of control. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you get an urge to go to the loo? Do you have any degree? No, of no urge at all. No urge at all. Overnight. None at all. Okay. Which may indicate you don't have the reflex loops to the sphincter. So if, if you're not actively bracing or, you know, sitting down to provide a squash to the area, you know, that becomes the cork in the bottle, then you, you don't have a closure to the bladder neck unless, you know, the pelvic floor has enough oomph to be able to get enough lift to close off the bladder neck. But of course, you can't walk around clenching all day. That's not how the muscle works. It has a degree of background activity and it might increase activity for a specific issue, you know, to stand up, to stand up and get to the toilet. But to stand up, get to the toilet, walk out to the kitchen, make a cup of to you know, tea and toast, walk, carry it out, stand up, walk to the phone. You, know, you, you can't clench the whole day. It doesn't work like that. So. Um, I mean, that, that might need a bit more thorough investigation bit from, you know, it depends how many weeks, months you are post-op as to how much investigation or how much it's just, just wait, just hang in there, or how much actually yeah. gets investigated. I'm six months post-op, post. but I, uh, yeah. at about eight weeks, I developed <laughs> an inguinal hernia, and that... Okay. That prevented me doing ex any exercises Exercise. for about 10 weeks. Yeah. 
Yeah. So whether that's sort of, it, you know, again, your pelvic floor is the back door to get your reflexes. If your nerves are passing messages, but if your nerves aren't passing messages, then there isn't that back door to get your reflexes switched on. The, the wiring's got to be passing messages for that message to get through. So it depends what's going on inside. Again, your surgeon might be able to clarify why for you things are a bit slower than you might have liked it to be. Certainly from our research guidelines, the walking and the dedicated pelvic floor exercise sets, at least you're giving yourself the best chance of getting things to kick in if you can. But you do a bit of walking. It might be 10 minutes, have a lie down, Later on, do another 10 minutes, have a lie down. You know, it might be a small amount. What can you do that doesn't make you leak more than you otherwise need to? You know, which means there's not that much activity that, you, you know, that you're doing in any one go, which would be very frustrating. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, yeah. Is it common to have an inguinal hernia after prostectomy? And is that likely to influence your contents? Um, I hadn't actually encountered all that many until the last year. So, but in the last year, I've had several men saying that they've developed one since the surgery. I've not read anything about it being a complication of robotic surgery, but I would wonder that it might be part of the robotic as opposed to the open which I, I can't really see any great reason why, is it that you already had a degree of hernia before and it's just sort of unsettled things and weakened things enough that therefore it's shown up? I'm not sure, but it's certainly nothing clear that I've read about, but I've certainly... Yes, had several men in the last year that have, like a few too many men in the last year, be talking about the inguinal hernia they've now got since the surgery. And uh, does that influence the content? Um, that's a hard one because if the inguinal hernia gives you feedback that you're straining, then it's actually probably helpful feedback. You know, if, to stand up with too much effort, you feel that bulge and discomfort you're going to stand up in a way that doesn't cause it to bulge. So it might actually be helpful. But of course, does that mean you're then not activating your core muscles to the same degree, your, your abdominal and pelvic control to the same degree, so therefore not getting the same degree of support to the bladder neck? Don't know. Don't know. Certainly, men who have their inguinal hernias repaired at the same time as their radical prostate surgery seem to recover really well after surgery because the feedback they get from the inguinal hernia surgery keeps their activities of daily life very strain free. They, they, you know, they can, it hurts to stand up, it hurts to bend over and lace up their shoes, it hurts to cough, it hurts anything with an abdominal pressure hurts so they don't do it. And of course it's the pressure that we're trying to avoid because we don't want that bearing down, we want that supporting up. But as for whether you get that same degree of feedback without muscle inhibition, I'm not sure. Uh, firstly, a kind of further on the question of the bicycles. Yep. It's very important to have the right sort of seat. Italy makes four excellent seats. I had one for my cyclocross first, which it, it takes all the pressure off the prostate, has a very big split, has also a metal duct to du duct air to the groin area. Mm -hmm. um, these seats also, because they take the pressure off the prostate, it doesn't affect PSA testing. Um, but f for the uh, for the biopsy, I was able to cycle the day I got out of hospital, no pain. With the surgery, um, 
I knew it would be much more difficult, so I got a seat for up, upright sitting which mm -hmm. was on a full suspension mountain bike mm -hmm. and made it as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. This is actually the, the best seat. It's leather and it's very soft um, and that, that worked very well. well it didn't have any pain. Yeah. These men didn't have pain, they just peed blood for weeks afterwards. Yeah, well, I didn't have any, <laughs> any problem. Yeah. Oh, actually, no, one did have a lot of pain yeah. after the biopsy, but no, it was the, yeah. the peeing blood after the biopsy was the problem. Yeah, and yeah. as far as uh, passing fluid, I can't get above 130 mil. Mm. You'd need to know what your volumes were before the prostate I surgery to know what your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. One more question. Yeah. Um, my urologist suggested that um, it's good to hold on to your urine because it helps the bladder expand. Yeah. Which means it can decrease its capacity to work. Yes. Like. So would you, you would agree with that? I yeah. do once you've got your reflex activity. Sure. So, so if that's, you know, four to six weeks, eight or so weeks, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Once you've got that reflex message to tell the sphincter to tighten, yeah, you want to push. Yeah, I, I your think the, the logic is if you only got a small bladder, you can only hold a small. You, so you yeah. frequently you're yeah. urinating. I agree. I agree. Makes the problem. Once you've got your reflexes, but in those early weeks, if you're all numb and dull, and you're waiting to feel an urge that's never going to come, you're probably passively seeping into your pad rather than any degree of holding on till you get an urge. Um, so. To, to actively pee rather than passively leak is probably more convenient. But once your reflexes are kicking into overnight, probably before daytime and, and mornings, probably before afternoon evenings, you want to start pushing your degree of control so that you're, you're not just waiting till you get an urge, but you're waiting to get an urge and then tell it to be quiet. And once you've told it to be quiet, it comes like a wave, it settles it goes away then which after prostate surgery sometimes things can be a bit inflamed and it doesn't go away it lingers but you lingers at a low level you're trying to defer it for five minutes if you can hold for five can you make it 10 can you build up to 20 minutes or longer the idea being that yeah you, you you're telling the bladder to be quiet relaxed go floppy and you're telling the sphincter to, pr to increase its tone and activity and you're getting the Blood it hold bigger volumes. You're practicing the holding on mechanisms rather than practicing the emptying. Yeah, yeah. But once you've got to that point, and certainly if you haven't got to that point by 12 weeks, you probably need to start working on it anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can we just do a quick little pelvic floor sort of exercisey bit? So I know there are some brochures that talk about. Sit in your car at traffic lights and practice your pelvic floor. I have a huge issue with that. The per pelvic floor is a postural muscle and it responds to gravity, to cue it in. So if you shuffle your bottom forward on your chairs so that you can slump terribly, if here's a physio telling you to, to slump in your chair, basically so that you've got more pressure on the back passage, so basically to sort of tip you that way so you're putting more pressure on your tailbone relax your legs relax your tummy so here's a terrible slump position think about that area around your back passage and just in front of that so that area of skin we call the perineum between your legs behind your scrotum very gently can you try and tuck that area up inside very gently so it's good that I'm not seeing anyone moving because it's just that little muscle we're looking at, not everything else. And let it relax. So think about that area between your legs and when you try to draw that in, just think how easily it is to clench your back passage. But that's, and now let it relax again, that's not the area we're looking for. You're not likely to have problems in the laundry, it's problems in the bathroom. So we've, we've got to get the right room happening here. It's the right tap we've got to turn off. So it's not about back passage, it's about the front. So if I can get you now to tuck your bottom back in the chair, keep your knees comfortably apart, and now bend forward. So whether your hands are on your knees or whether your elbows are down on your thighs, now by bringing you forward, now I'm bringing you sort of 
so that that area is onto the chair. So now your, your tailbone and buttock muscles are free. You've got the pressure of the chair up between your legs and they're nice firm chairs, which is good. So think about that area between your legs, behind the scrotum. That's the area we're focusing on tucking up and forwards. So it's about leaving your back passage out of it. It's not about passing wind, it's about turning off your bladder. So it's about tucking up that area to tuck perhaps an up and forwards. Does it feel different to when you were leaning back? Does it, has it brought the activity a bit further forward? Because it's the front bit we need. It's that tuck at the front. That's the sort of action that you want to be working on. So where I've got that um, sort of bluish sheet, it's trying to work out how far forward you need to be to get a really good lift at the front or how much more upright you, you can keep it at the front when you're upright. Because real life is not leaning forward. Real life is just where you happen to be. But you want to get the contraction that you get as if you're leaning forward. So if you can get that tuck up and forward at the front when you're upright, great. But if, you can't, if you've got to stay forward, well, that's where you're starting. And you're trying to challenge yourself to get more upright. So the easy position is forward, but real life is more upright. Can you get it when you're standing? Can you get it when you're standing on one leg? Can you get it when you put a plate in the dishwasher? When you're reaching to the back seat of the car to get your mobile phone? When you're reaching for the boom gate ticket? Whatever you're doing, it's that tuck up and forward of that front part of the pelvic floor you're trying to switch on. So your exercise is about practicing it. When you can think about it, focus on it, get that action happening, and then you're practicing holding it. Now if you've got to be able to turn it on and get up and walk to the bathroom, you've got to be able to hold it for a length of time. So can you hold it for a while? But it's not, no point holding it and your breath at the same time. So you might get that tuck happening and hold it while you breathe in and out and in and out and in and out and keep going in and out. And how many in and outs can you do and keep holding it? That's a bit of endurance in there. Because if you can't hold your pelvic floor up while you breathe, you're not going to be able to do much other activity. <laughs> it's not going to make walking very easy. Can you do a few of those contractions? So if you can hold it for a few breaths in and out, can you do a few of those contractions in a row? And you know, we're sort of roughly aiming 10 for 10. 10 seconds. Pardon? 10 seconds. Hold yeah, 10 seconds. yeah. While you're breathing. So you've got to, if you're focusing on the breathing rather than the seconds, you're more likely to breathe. Yeah? And then, it, then you want, might need a bit of speed in there. If you're walking down a flight of stairs or down a hill, you've got to get a muscle to jump in quick. So you want a bit of a speed in there. It's that gentle tuck, but it's doing it quickly. And it's all very well to sit there and hold your breath while you do it, but can you count out loud while you do it? Because if you're counting out loud, it's about keeping your outside muscles relaxed while you use that gentle inside muscle. So it, you've got to at least be able to count out loud, let alone be able to do it and run on the spot. Makes it even harder. But that's, yeah, especially if it's a real height, I won't do it because the microphone, but that real high step running or star jumps, ha, huh, that's even harder. But can you, can you get that quick action while you do star jumps? Because that's a really good test. That'd be good sort of 12 weeks on. But that's, that's not real life stuff. Oh, well, the star jumps might be. Um, holding and faster, that's probably where most brochures end it. But what about real life? You want to add a bit of strain into this. So a cough, a blowing your nose, a picking a bag up off the floor. What's something that involves abdominal pressure that you encounter in your everyday? I have, quite some years ago I had a guy who was a landscape gardener who ran his own business. So he had to employ other people to do the physical bit until he was ready to. So he needed to get back to work. He leaked a lot. Um, so one of the activities we started on was to dig a hole. So in the morning, he would start with a little shovel, spade, whatever they're called, and he dug a, an, a few shovelfuls until he felt he'd got to the end of his endurance. He'd come in and lie down. 
in the afternoon he'd go out and he'd fill that hole in and day by day the holes got bigger deeper because he instead of you know 12 shovelfuls he could get up to 100 he could get up to 200 so I can only imagine what the neighbours thought but then the shovels got bigger to more the sort of industrial size that he normally shoveled with so the load of soil got heavier because he was using that muscle to brace for each and every dig of that shovel. Um, you know, pavers into the wheelbarrow so he could do circuits around the backyard. So how many pavers and how many circuits could he do? How much strain could he resist against so he could build that up? Because he needed to get beyond walking. He needed to get back to his real life. Um, so, so, you know, a cough might be the one you start with, but you want to add to things that involve a strain. And then, of course, there's movement, so I'd call that functional. So, initially, it might just be to brace, to, to turn that muscle on, as if you're leaning forward, but you're not, because you're clever, before you stand up, before you reach down to the floor, before you lunge for lawn bowls, before you put the dish in the in the dishwasher. So, so to actually practice that in your set of exercises. So it's not just is it holding and is it fast, it's, it's are you actually able to use it in real life scenarios. And they're the sorts of things you should practice. So maybe on the back of that bluish sheet you go home and note what makes me leak? What are your activities that make you leak? Is it putting the ticket in the boom gate? Is it putting the dish in the dishwasher? Is it when you're standing there at the, at the dishwasher, stepping to the side? Something so little, but it's enough that you leak a bit. Before you step to the side, can you brace? Can you turn that muscle on before you? Well, of course you can, but how do you remember? If you've written it on your list, every time you add something to that list, you read through and go, oh, okay, yeah, I've got to remember that one, got to remember that one. Before the boom gate ticket, no, turn it on first before you get that boom gate ticket. Because that's the behaviour and that's what's going to take the eight to 12 months, eight to, you know, six, six to 12 months to cue you in to brace before you do those activities. Yeah. Yep. Are there gym exercises that you would recommend? Um, anything where you're in an upright or forward leaning position to start with. So anything where you, let's say, sitting doing a, you know, a, a peck push together type thing or the, the lat pull downs with, with you in a slightly forward leaning. Anything where you're, you know, not, not too much strain, something you can breathe as you go. This is after sort of eight to 12 weeks. Yep, yep. Um, something where your body is in that, that gravity cueing the front part. The things I would avoid would be things like rowing machines, um, you know, lying down, bench presses, um, really heavy things like chin-ups and things that are, you know, that, that real abdominal strain type things or in a reclined position. Hence my dislike of recumbent bikes. I just think that lying back with your legs out in front of you, it's a lot of abdominal strain that's going to make it really hard to cue in the front part of your pelvic floor. Um, and I just, just dislike them from a posture point of view because they're a very stooped position, whereas a, a bike where you're more in an upright, extended position, much better for your general posture. Yeah. As a physio, I had to put the posture in there. Yeah. Uh, after my read, I uh, read after my, uh, radical postectomy, uh, I was advised to see a lady specialist uh, because of uh, the lady's problem with uh, pelvic uh, floors. Yeah. And they sort of uh, did most of my exercises lying down. Yeah. Now, is it probably a bit more gentle initially or...? Uh um, I had a guy recently who had a, a real-time ultrasound done, again, lying down. You know, it, it's not real life. It, mm. Pelvic floor is a postural muscle. We use it to support against gravity. So to get your exercise lying down is, it's not cueing you to use the muscles as you would normally use them in your everyday. It's also not giving you an idea of, of have you got that anti-gravity movement? Can, can you nod the bladder against gravity? So it's from an assessment and from a 
treatment point of view, it's not, it's not functional. You're probably not leaking when you're lying down. It's when you're up and moving you need to use it. So you, you well, probably... Uh... Yeah, but, but from a helping you more to, to get you to cue in when, you, when you're upright would actually... It makes a lot more sense neurologically. Yeah.